Today is May 31st, 2022. Uh, it's a great pleasure to introduce Dr. Ehard Schreck to our oral history series dedicated to the history of digital recording. Dr. Schreck belongs to the select group of intellectual property centenarians, uh, not because of his age, uh, but because he holds over 100 published US patents. He's one of the few experts in hard disk drive tribology. Tribology is the science of sliding bodies, which usually involves friction, wear, and lubrication. The reason why it's so critical to disk drive technology is because the magnetic head is riding, and sometimes sliding, very close to the spinning disk surface under extremely high velocity of up to uh, close to 100 miles per hour. In the disk drive industry, tribology therefore refers not only to the reliability of the device, but also the push to lower and precisely control the head disk distance, also known as the flying height. During his career, Dr. Schreck has helped to reduce this flying height from a few micrometers to just under one nanometer, which is about the length of a just a few air molecules. This has enabled over a million fold increase in storage density. Dr. Schreck, welcome. Let us start the interview with your childhood. Uh, where were you born and where did you grow up? Okay, first, uh, thank you, Bruno, for the invitation and the nice introduction. Um, yeah, so I was born in a small town. Small town means like 50,000 to 40,000 people in Ravensburg in Germany. So there was a, what can I say? It was a very nice environment I grew up. You could uh, roam around as a kid outside. Yeah, there was no, no worries about crimes and anything. The kids just came home when it was dark. So that was very pleasant for me to explore nature without any um, limitations with my friends. So that was good. And so in school, did you have early interest in science? Were you, uh, you I know, think doing the experiments at home? Things yeah, like that? The, the, early, the early interest, I think I need to credit my dad. Um, he was a simple tool maker, but he was very talented in um, building mechanical devices, all kinds of things. And I'm still wondering today where he had this knowledge from because I really never saw a lot of books or saw him reading. But he knew a lot of things um, of science. Yeah? We don't talk about black holes now, but uh, in general, um, more than the average person knows, he knew actually. And, and they, got, they got me definitely interested. And uh, the model shop we had due to his profession um, you know, in Germany we have basements, so we had he he um, beautified the basements very nicely, and we had all kind of tools and materials, and um, he taught me very early on. Uh, first, it was like an holy grail down there, you know? so I was not allowed to use his precious tools, but um, more and more um, he he had more confidence in in me using the tools and. That gave me a lot of freedom, and so I was more or less the, the tool maker for our friends also. You know, when we need to set up something, they all knew, oh, Erhard, you got the basement there. <laughs> Can you make it? Did you have any close calls with, uh, you know, safety problems and explosion? Well, and um, yeah, so we built um, pipe bombs. <laughs> and... Uh, there were close calls, I would say, and actually fr and friends got, got injured, not too badly, but um, it happened. And I also, even my dad hated this, coming out from the um, World War, you know, experience. He hated all kinds of shooting devices. So when he saw me, even with a slingshot, which I built many in this basement, <laughs> he, he was very angry. And... Um, I was kind of inventive with building other shooting devices, yeah, and and accidents happened, yeah. yeah. But, so. but your dad was had the foresight to think that perhaps that would lead you to uh, having a career. I don't, in I don't know if he had this in mind. He definitely tried to interest me in um, technology, yeah, and and um, clearly the setup he provided for me this this availability of machinery and tools and and he taught me a lot of tricks how to make things i mean there were 
the one fascinating part I, I think I never forget is, hopefully I never forget, is um, we needed a spring, you know, a steel spring, a small, uh, not a small one. We needed a long one, meters long. And I thought, okay, I don't know where to buy a meter long spring, you know. Then he said, oh, we make it ourselves. And he showed me how to make a spring with the vise and two uh, wood blocks and then a wire and a steel and you just wind it and it by itself it makes a spring yeah and that was fascinating so so tricks like this i think that stuck in me and um, even according to his standard i think i never really uh, uh, came up to his perfection he was a perfectionist i think i'm one too but maybe not the same type um, so, so he taught me these little tricks, and that made me, it's fascinating, yeah. So at what stage did you think you wanted to be a scientist or an engineer? What age did you, and were you good at school, by the way? Were you good at So I science? was definitely horrible in languages, yeah. I mean, French, for example, <laughs> I failed miserably. <laughs> um, I knew that I had, in, in math, I think I was uh, doing, doing good, but in physics, um, that turned up later uh, in high school, and part of it was because I had an excellent physics teacher. So I would say I credit my interest, so part maybe my dad and environment I had there, but then the physics teacher was um, really motivating because I saw in him a person who spent, he didn't care about work hours, you know, he, um, we had, um, I played badminton at a time and the gym was next to the, to the physics lecture, lecture room. So when we played badminton and came out at 10 o'clock at night, I saw the lights on in the lecture room. And that was because the physics teacher was preparing the experiments for the next day physics class. So he had no no uh, limitation on himself how much energy he spent. And he actually told us one time, we had 30 people at the time in the class, he said, you know, I know exactly all the work I do, I do it for three people. We had three good people in the class in, in physics, yeah? And luckily I was one of them. And uh, when, when he said this, that he is aware that he does all this work, for for these three people maybe that was even wrong i don't know maybe he should have taken care more of the other ones i think now yeah <laughs> but at the time uh, we were proud you know that the the teacher does all this work for us yeah and he did what i always liked experiments and uh, i'm an experimentalist um, clearly and uh, probably this is because even today, many um, experiments we did at that time, I remember very well because they were so, you know, like having a wire with the weight going through an ice block overnight, yeah, because the water melts due to the high pressure. And then in the morning you come back to school and the wire is cut full through the ice block and the ice block is intact, yeah? So, so experiments like this are just, um, I don't know, it's kind of a, a um, what do you call it? It's a change in your in your mindset, yeah. And I think that's really fascinated me about nature that you have these almost looks like miracle events, but you can explain it, yeah. With physics, yeah. yeah, with physics, right? So then comes um, college. Time to decide, you know, what to do and where to go for college. So again, was it very early on, many years before college, that you knew you wanted to? going to physics, or how did I, that happen? I don't, I don't really think so. Um, it's kind of funny how, how sometimes things happen. The, so the University of Constance, which was only about um, 40 kilometers away, one hour drive, there, and there was a lake in between, so you need a ferry normally. You could drive around, but um, there was a new university. So very small, we only had like 2,000 students and the classes were very, very small, so you had a very intimate contact to the um, lecturer. That, that was really great. And um, they had a physics, solid state physics department, so it didn't have all these variety of departments like Munich or Munster, or the bigger universities, yeah? Um, and 
Then I had a friend there who graduated one year before me, and he's, he said, to him, oh, Erhard, why don't you look at Constance? Yeah, maybe, maybe you like that one. He was in biology, and he said they have a nice physics department. And yes, I, I did have the interest for physics, and I, well, still because I played badminton um, and had to go to the practice, it was convenient to two times a week I could still simply drive home, you know, for the practice and I was at the university at the same time, and uh, the university was in a, in a nice setting, you know, there was the lake, there were the Alps, so you had everything for skiing, windsurfing, all these things were there too. It was very attractive from, from, from everything, I would say, from the smallness of the university, the, the close contact you had with the professors, that was all uh, a very ideal setting at the time. Did it come to your head that perhaps you could aim f higher and perhaps go to a fancier university in no, Germany? No, never. You know, this is funny. When I came to the US, the people always talk about, oh, this is a great university, this is great, and this is great. And I, I think we and our I, we did not have this elite thinking somehow. Um, I, I don't know if this is good or bad. You know, only later in Germany, they also tried to set up the center of excellence universities and the rating and honestly I don't know <laughs> is this um, needed or not I'm not quite sure I think good people a good setting is definitely helpful but good people can can come out of any setting I find yeah so you went to uh, to physics um, was it clear in your head that physics could lead to engineering? Uh, I know in France, for example, you know, the, the boundary is fairly fuzzy between physics, chemistry, and engineering. People don't make, mm. you know, oftentimes, the, you know, the distinction. Was it very clear in your head that you wanted to be an engineer? Or did you think perhaps you could be a, a scholar? Um, that's an interesting question. I always liked I think I always liked experiments, building things, yeah. But I also liked mentoring, so there I, I usually um, participated in mentoring younger students and I typically found it very rewarding when you teach young people and they find interest or you, you, you start developing, help them to develop interest. I think this is extremely rewarding. And looking back at this, I always thought again, my high school teacher, yeah, that must have been nice for him to see even a small fraction of 30 people were really um, super interested in what he was doing and paying attention. So, but, but scholar, I think it was never uh, really on the top of my list. I always liked it, but I always liked to be <coughs> to be um, involved by myself with experiments. Making things. Uh, yeah. Making things, mm -hmm. yeah. So which um, discipline did you like best in, uh, in your undergrad studies? Um, when you mean discipline, um, so I liked, well, I don't know what discipline. What you know, what solid state physics. Uh, yeah, I mean solid state mechanics, physics. Uh, Mechanics actually always fascinated me because I, I, in a way, I think it's kind of underrated <laughs> yeah, because there are so many things in, in mechanical engineering or in mechanics which um, even today not fully understood yeah, and, and make things work. Yeah. So I definitely liked, um, it, it comes back to this um, uh, experiments, experimental setup. I also liked automating things, you know, this was the time when computers moved into the lab and um, yeah, at the time everything was slow with 2400 bouts when you needed to connect something. But I, I helped on the side, I helped to simplify and automate um, experiments for other people, you know, just help them to get the tools and the infrastructure in place so they could be more efficient. I mean, that's that's the thing that I always like too, sort of combination. Yeah. So then comes um, you know a graduation. You went to uh, on to uh, do a PhD. Could you tell us about this? Where you went and how you chose your PhD subject? Oh, the PhD subject. Um, how did that came all about? Oh, 
it, we, we got a new professor into the university, um, Professor Transfeld. He came from the Max Planck Institute at the time. And he, he had, um, I think, based on the MPI, the Max Planck Institute, he had some more industry um, connections, which, as you probably know, in Germany, the universities are more like more ivory towers. They do not have this, you know, we don't have spin-offs for startups and all this, at least not at the time. So university, you were more or less free what you wanted to do. It's not like here when I see, um, when I started working at IBM and we work with Frank Torkey in San Diego or with Bougie in Berkeley, we, we provide already the tools for the graduate students over there so they're completely prepared and have a running start when they join the industry. That's not in Germany. Yeah? In Germany, you, you kind of free, free-spirited. Yeah? Nobody, I don't think when I do my PhD work in Germany, oh, where do I get a job with this thing? Yeah, this is not the thinking. So <clears throat> when the Professor Transfeld came, he had some connection to um, Varta. You know, this is a battery manufacturer, V-A-R-T-A, Varta. And they were at the time, so, so this was in the 80s, they were interested in um, maybe lithium batteries. You know, they had some thoughts about this. And, and there was, um, there was um, a finding that lithium, as a thin film, it has different um, ionic conductivities. And basically, my professor said, oh, yeah, do, you want to, do you want to investigate this um, ionic conductivity as a function of thickness or something like this, of lithium iodide? Yeah? And that's what I did. So, so I got um, um, picked up some electrochemistry. And it was uh, interesting from, I think it was more interesting for me for the experimental challenges rather than, because there was no battery in the end, there was no real um, something you finish, you know, you can use. It, it was really only the, the study of the conductivity. And I think I finished this fine. Um, I was happy with it. But it was clear to me that this was not something I wanted to continue. You know, the people who work um, 50 years in the same field, yeah, and, and that was clearly not what I, what I wanted to do. But I finished my PhD um, in, in a good way. And then I was happy that I could do something different. <laughs> yeah. So Ehard, during your PhD work, um, did you publish uh, scientific uh, papers in yeah. refereed journals? Again, this is, in, this is Germany. <clears throat> there is not this uh, super push and power uh, push on, on, on how many did you publish. Yeah. So you, you expected for your PhD to make maybe one publication to, to um, condense down your results. And that's what I did, or I had more than one, and also in collaboration with other people at the same time. But for the PhD itself, that's all that was needed. Yeah. And to, to be honest, I, I'm almost a little bit, um, what should I say? I question a little bit the publication urge, you know, we have here. I think most publications are not high quality, to say it in a simple term. And um, if, if I compare public publications from today, I think to publications from the 30s or 20s, where people more or less wrote, it's almost like books what they wrote in the publication. And they also wrote in publication what did not work, not only what worked. Yeah? And I thought that was uh, much more, much harder to do than what is being the way we publish today. And it's a lot for the counting of the publication. So I have a, a little bit of mixed feeling to publications. I think, I think a good publication takes a tremendous amount of work. Yeah. So earlier you mentioned you know, the early days of uh, computing and maybe even personal computing. Did you have access to uh, lab computers and did you have any interest in, in you know, computing then? Yeah, we, um, <coughs> we had, uh, yes, we did and I had access and um, so yes, the university at the time, we just started to buying personal uh, compu PCs, you know, there were a lot of different brands as you know. We had a computing center, the, and, and I spent actually a lot of time in the computing center with the punch cards, as you remember, yeah. 
So, so <coughs> that was good. And because not too many people were using the mainframe, there was always room for me and, and maybe two or three other guys. And we were sitting there at night, you know, and did our programming. So that was a, a really nice environment. Did you program in Fortran? I used Algol 60, and I actually wrote a, yeah, one thing I did there, I wrote a full word processing program, which the university was almost <coughs> trying to set a standard for the university for writing publications. It could handle everything, you know, references. Um, and, and one person, I wrote it while one person wrote his PhD work. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so whenever there were new needs, I modified the program. And in the end, it was a, a solid word processing program. And um, yeah, so, so that's, uh, that's a finished product. But I also did, on the side uh, during the PhD, I wrote a carpool uh, managing program. So instead of having the whiteboard uh, for the students who looked for um, carpool opportunities, I said they were mostly outdated when you look at the whiteboard. You know, it was already last week gone, but you looked something for now. And I thought that should be on a computer at the time. So <clears throat> making a long story short, and then I thought, oh, maybe I can make money with that. <laughs> I programmed that thing, and when they want an address, they need to put in some money to get the address out of it. That's, that was the thinking. So I got the computer from a computer store in town. I said, I do some advertisement, uh, advertising for you, um, so your name will show up. So he gave me the free computer, and um, I did all this. And then uh, first the university was fighting and said, no, 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 we cannot set this up. And you, we need power. Who pays for the power? You know, this is Germany. <laughs> so in the end, in the end, we, I, I got them to, to give me a space with an outlet nearby, <laughs> so near the cafeteria. So the people, when they were going for lunch, then they could check the computer. Yeah? And, and sooner or later, Suddenly, the, the press shows up from a German-wide magazine, yeah, a newspaper, and came and reported. So the university then invited them. <laughs> and then there was a big article, University of Constance, first university with automated computer uh, carpool. So suddenly, they took all this. <laughs> you became a, a hero yeah. from... So I became kind yeah. of famous. Not famous, but yeah, they knew it, I was doing this. And then they gave me a space in the library. Um, so we set up the computer in the library, it was more quiet there. And, and this is the funny part. Again, I, I actually like to help people. It, it makes me happy when I, when I can help them. Yeah, that's right. So what I did very often after I had eaten, I go to the library and just sit next to the computer and listening when the people were using it, you know. And I had a little book next to it where the people could make notes what they liked and disliked. And, and I saw how the people liked it, you know, and, and uh, the feedback was positive. And <clears throat> that gave me a lot of enjoyment. And by just seeing this, I forgot completely about the money part. <laughs> because this gave enough um, feedback for me or positive um, feelings. Forget the money. Better, yeah. better than money. Yeah. Better than money, absolutely. Yeah. So, so that was great. And, and this thing actually, <clears throat> I... I left then to, so this was operating for a long time, but then I left to the US and then I got another friend uh, continuing the maintenance, yeah? And he actually, he didn't only do maintenance, he converted this thing on, on web-based. And then it was on the web and it went very well, um, this program. And then there was another University of Stuttgart, or there were people that basically copied our interface, everything, put it also on the web and had a nice slogan, kangaroo and vecbizdu means kangaroo and off you go. <laughs> and they charge money and we were kind of angry because they used our interface. I said, you could at least give us some credit where you got this from, <laughs> which they did then. Really? Okay. <laughs> but they made money with it. So these were the, the motivation from the other side. We were just happy to provide this service. Yeah. 
I also understand that you have some early interest in uh, inte intellectual properties and patents in the uh, area of uh, automotive. Oh, yeah. Um, thanks for asking this. Yeah, there, there was this idea with the um, electronic windshield wiper, which today you find in almost any car, any newer, a little bit more pricier car. So yeah, <coughs> there was an um, interesting development. I, I had an old car and um, it didn't even have the uh, the 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 interval intermittent uh, the interval wiper you know where you every five seconds it it moves yeah so I thought I need to do something about it and I come up with this idea for the for an optical detection system where and this is Germany again where you have uh, winter snow ice on the windshield. So I needed a detector that was inside the windshield, so you don't scrape it off when you need to clean your windshield from the outside. And I came up with this optical system, which uses a total reflection of a beam inside the windshield. And uh, that worked extremely well. And through an other colleague who knew someone in the automotive industry, he connected me to a person from Audi and VW. And, and because he always said, Erhard, you need to do something with this thing. This works so well, yeah. And um, the person actually came from Stuttgart to um, Constance and wanted a test drive. Uh, so he wanted to see the system, how it works. And it was beautiful. It was rainy on and off, like, like it very often was in this area. And the thing just worked beautifully. And he was impressed. But then in the end, it, it never came to anything because when part of it probably was when he asked me how much would it cost when we integrate this. And then I said um, at the time, maybe, maybe 10, 15 German marks, yeah. And he said, oh, way too expensive. In the automotive industry, we, we look for cents, you know, and pennies. Yeah, so this, this will never make it. So at the time, I, I just gave up and that was it. Then I thought about um, patent writing, and I wrote my patent, but I never really submitted it. I don't know, um, maybe I was too, too cautious about this. Today I know better, um, I could easily have gotten a patent on this one, but I didn't. And then it was sitting there, so this was in the early 80s, maybe around 80, eight, yeah, 80 probably, where I did all this. And it was funny, my colleagues from, from the lab, they always, um, showed it to other people and they spit on my windshield to make it work. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> when it was rainy and it worked beautifully. The only problem I had is the thing fell off once in a while. There was no such thing like a super glue, yeah. But that was not a big deal, I know. These things can be solved, yeah. And and that is probably something I, I kept uh, until today, you know, when when you submit patents, very often you have evaluators on the other side that say, oh, but there's a problem. You, how do you solve this? How you so This is not the, not the point of a patent. The, the main, in two years, you have new materials and new ways of doing things. So what is today a problem, unresolvable, you can fix in two or five years, yeah? So I, I'm never really um, discouraged by these things. But um, so the, Nothing happened because the, the guy from Audi VW um, thought it's too expensive. And then when I was done with my PhD work in 87, I thought, man, this is still not on the market. <laughs> I cannot believe it. Not even the Japanese, because the Japanese were usually a little bit ahead of the German automobile. German automobiles did not even have power windows. Everyone was frowning on air condition. You, we don't need something like this. You know, we the Germans, we can take this heat and this cold. <laughs> Horrible. <laughs> so nothing happened. And then I thought there is Bosch, the famous um, uh, company who does um, car, electric, and electronic. So I, I wrote them a letter that I have this idea. And if they wanted to know more about it, and then they invited me and I drove there, gave a uh, uh, presentation. The room was full of engineers and they were all, from what I can tell, interested. You know, some, someone came out and complimented me then after the presentation. And they sent me off. They didn't pay for gasoline. They didn't give me a lunch, nothing. <laughs> when I look back at it, I said, this was really miserable. <laughs> so. And, and then I didn't hear anything from them anymore, you know. I, I felt 
I did this because I felt the idea. It worked so good because I had it in my car. It was really an enabler for safer driving. It prevented you, you know, when you have a wet road and you go, you want to pass another car. Then you first you go close to the other car, but then you get all this spray water. So, so you need to turn on the windshield wiper and then you need to watch the left side if it's free to pull over. All these things, uh, I thought, man, this is so easy with this automated system, yeah, it just does it. So I thought this should be in the car, that's why I went to Bosch and then, yeah, after the presentation there was no more contact and then it took a long time, so this was 87, and I think um, it was probably the mid-90s until I saw these, the automatic windshield wiper showing up in high-end cars. And did, did Bosch, were, was Bosch the first one to... Uh Actually, I don't know. I think I'm pretty sure in Germany it was. Yeah, I don't know what um, Japanese cars did, um, but in Germany, I never looked if it's a, a Bosch brand or what it was. But I looked up the patterns, and uh, there was one from Bosch, and it's the it's it, the principle hasn't changed. It's the same thing. See, I thought initially um, the beam to get a reliable function of that wiper needs to go across the entire windshield. It turns out no need. I had like um, maybe five centimeters, two, two, three inches. Yeah. Just need drops to fall between the. Uh, yeah, there was enough. And, and if this is in the right location, and you know, today you see, it, you just look at the windshield. It's in the middle, um, basically where the rear view mirror is on the windshield, and this is a good location. And uh, the beauty is, yeah, you cannot damage it from the outside. You still can scrape off your eyes. Because VW at the time, they told me, oh yeah, we work on something like this, uh, like this um, system you have. But we have a sensor outside that had basically um, like a thermistor, you know, a little heater. And when it rained and the water came on, it cooled it. That was outside and it was not on the windshield. So by the way, Tesla today, they used the cameras because at the time we didn't have a camera. So I always thought about cameras, but there, there was no way you can make an inexpensive camera for this. So Tesla is using camera. <laughs> Interesting. Okay, so Ehard, then um, graduated, got, got your PhD in your pocket. Um, you came to the US. Tell well, us about then came the, first then came the change. You know, I said this ionic conductivity was nice for the PhD work, but not something I felt um, uh, I'm married to, I need to continue. So again, my, my professor, who was also an, um, I must say, he was also an excellent, um, yeah, he was not a, he was an experimentalist too, the way he was thinking. And, and he did, um, he frustrated me sometimes because I was doing an estimate for certain experiments about the magnitude of the effect and everything and it took me like two days to, to come up with a number. Then I go to him and he sits, he always had a f um, fountain pen and he sits there and in like, then in like two minutes he says, yeah, you're right. <laughs> I don't know, physics was his second nature, yeah? And when, when he was in, in um, lectures, where theoreticians gave lectures, typically he had at the end of the presentation, he summarized the entire lecture in a very simple way so everyone could understand it, yeah? And, and that was just a, so that was my type of guy, thinking, thinking uh, in, in simple terms, I, I never like quantum mechanics, I must say, yeah. And I think he never appreciated it either. But um, he, he was very good in, in, doing, in doing this um, very basic physics thinking, which explained also very complex processes. So that, that was, for me, t very intriguing. And he was fascinated by the um, scanning tunneling microscopy, which was done by Rohr at the time in Zurich, which is only another one hour drive away. He, you know, he, he appreciated this simple mechanical um, setup and you can map atoms with it. Now this was all in, in UHV and, and you know, very vibration damped. Uh, so you always thought, hmm, this cannot be really simplified. This is a complicated system. So he said, Erhard, um, are you interested in this? I, I would like to set up um, a work group with this technique, you know. 
And I said, yes, definitely, I, I like that one too. And he, he thought also, and we both agreed, maybe this can be done much simpler, yeah? So it maybe works without a UHV and we can just do it. So he sent me then, he had connections actually to the IBM research lab, the Richelicon, and then he arranged that I could do a postdoc there. So I learned um, at IBM Research, which was uh, like, again, like a holy facility, you know, when I was there. That was the Zurich That research. was Zurich, right, yeah. Right. So there was Rohr Robinik who got um, the Nobel Prize. And then there was, while I was there, there was Bettnotz, and what was, the, I forgot the other, co the other person's name, who for the high superconductor, they got the Nobel Prize, yeah. That was while I was there. And I felt like, what am I doing in this place with all this Nobel Prize? <laughs> I felt like, gee, this is wrong, yeah. <laughs> but it's also an interesting anecdote to this one. When, when, um, when they got the Nobel Prize, they could not celebrate on the premises, on the IBM premises with the sect, with the, with the, the, the wine, yeah, because there was no alcohol permitted <laughs> on the premises. Worldwide so, in IBM, yeah. Yeah. Well, in France, not in France. Well, not in, in France. In France, they had beer oh, and wine. They had a special <laughs> <laughs> authorization. <laughs> I mean, so there we had to go. I, I thought in mines also. Yeah. So we had to go outside on the street, on the sidewalk, away from the premises to toast. You know, that was really funny. But it was. Um, so that was my first contact with IBM Research. Yeah. So was it within your PhD program or No, that was after. After, after, after I was I done with the PhD, the professor asked me if I had interest in this STM, uh, AFM technology, and, and, and I did. So that was my opportuni opportunity to go there. And um, at the time I had, um, we already did a little bit work in Constance, um, so I, I, again, I like software, I like programming, so I had actually written, um, an, I think, a very good um, AFM uh, analysis program to display the, the, the shapes you get, the images and all this. So I had written something, which I even sold one copy <laughs> to a startup. So that was interesting. And then after this one year, I came back and set up the um, STM AFM work group in Constance un under, under the same professor, yeah. So that was new at the University of Constance, this kind of work. And um, I think it, it actually, um, yeah, it, it went very well. We had, um, I, again, I like, I like simple, simple approaches in experiments. So I used for AFM detection, instead of using piezo and all these funny things, I used um, um, uh, electric microphone, you know, the, you can buy for a dollar or something like this. And the membrane, this is where we put the sample on, and the membrane is vibrating, and then you take, so I, I did estimate the sensitivity should be good enough, and we could actually get atomic resolution on... on uh, so use a voice coil actuation. You basically, yeah. well, this was capacitive. The electric yeah. microphones work capacitively, but you're right, a voice coil could probably do the same thing. But maybe with lower bandwidth. Yeah. Maybe lower bandwidth. So this thing was really sensitive, and, and um, where I felt actually good is at some point, Binnick, you know, the Nobel Prize winner for the STM, he approached me and he said, I like your idea with this microphone, yeah, this is so sensitive. And he was at the time working, uh, he wanted to detect um, uh, gravitational waves. So he was looking for a sensor to detect gravitational waves. And then he thought, oh, maybe this type of capacitive microphone, the, 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 the scheme, yeah, would be sensitive enough. It didn't go anywhere, but at least he, he felt it was a good idea for that purpose. Yeah, well, as you know, today they do it with today, interferometry, with li LIGO. Yeah, yeah, yeah li right. Yeah. So, so that was good, and um, uh, yeah, the, this AF, again, this AFM STM technology is something in in my direction. It's a, it's understandable. It's it's it it is simple, and still. 
fascinating how much uh, signal and sensitivity and knowledge you can get out of this. Yeah. And very multidisciplinary, right? You need Absolutely. To look at it you physics, mechanics. You can do uh, anything you want. Chemistry. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah signal yeah. processing. Yeah. yeah. So, so from what I understand, you you learned the trade at IBM and I then brought the it back to yeah. Constance to and, Constance. and built up a center there. Right. And and then so you ask how do I get to the U.S. So. At the time when I did my PhD work, <coughs> there was um, G.P. Singh. He came with Transfeld from the MPI. He was an Indian guy. And he stayed at our university for, I think, maybe five years. And he was waiting for the visa to come to the US. But during that time, he stayed in Constance. And I worked with him um, also on this ionic conductivity. And um, then he got the visa and he left. And at some point, um, you know, things change, nothing is static. So many people, my friends, left to other locations from the university. And at some point, I felt like, oh, what am I doing here? You know, I, I also felt suddenly, even Constance is a nice place, I wanted to see something else. And then I contacted GP Singh. I didn't know at the time he worked actually at IBM in, in Almaden Research Center. And I asked him in January, I said, oh, GB, you have a space for a postdoc or something, and yeah. And then he said, um, no, not at this point, but I'll let you know. And in, uh, was it April, he, he responded back and said, okay, I have now an opening, and, and this is when I just came over to the US. So the idea was to work for, you know, postdoc one year, but that got extended then one and a half year, and then I got a permanent job opportunity. But that was the first time I had no, ab no idea about disk drives. This is the first time I, I saw a rotating disk, a spin stand, a head flying, yeah. And um, absolutely new, but at the same time, there was, uh, I just saw a lot of opportunities with this thing, you know. And, uh, there was a head flying over this, looked to me like a capacitor. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so you can apply a voltage and you get the cooler forces, you can play with this. And um, he had something in mind where he put me on um, to measure um, similar asperity temperatures. You know, when the head, um, you mentioned it, when the head flies at the time, like it was only a micro inch, 25 nanometers. But when the head flies and hits an, an object which is on the disc, you get this frictional heating. And he wanted to know, because there were publications that said, oh, this reaches flash temperature. You know, it's basically glowing like 700 degrees. And people observed, observed this. And he said, oh, maybe we can measure this. And he had already, this was before I joined, he had designed a structure in the head that was supposed to do this measurement. And it turned out the structure, the way it was designed, did, did not work. Yeah? And then we saw already, um, OK, this, this project is, go <coughs> is gone. We need to do something else. And then I realized the structure um, which was made had um, like a thermocouple, different junctions. You know, there was the uh, magnetoresistive element, the uh, nickel ion part. And then there were two leads. I forgot now tantalum, I think. Yeah. So we had uh, dissimilar materials making contact. And I realized, OK, the entire structure did not work for this experiment. But I can use this contact of the dissimilar material as a thermocouple. And that actually worked. So I could move my structure as a proof. I could move it over the asperity. And on the one side, I got a negative peak. And on the other side, I got a positive peak. So I knew exactly this is the thermocouple effect. And so we could measure then um, the, not very accurately, I would say, because at the time, I didn't have the capability to do thermal modeling. So, the, you know, to calculate the, 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 the big scale, the, basically the average temperature you detect, and then uh, calculate it back to the real peak temperature that was very inaccurate, but we, we got some numbers out of it, so that was good. So what year was that? That was in, so 89, 90. 89, there was 90. 90. So MR heads were just starting? MR heads were just starting, and that 
Right, the MR heads were, this was a fascinating thing, yeah, they were just starting and they were basically a similar structure, you know. Today we have the, um, what we call the ECS, you know, this um, embedded contact sensor, which is simply a, um, a re electrical resistor on the air bearing surface, which gets heated up uh, or cooled when it comes close to the disc. And the, the reader at the time had about the same size like today these sensors. So I actually, I'm <laughs> I almost claim, I, I shouldn't say invent, but I uh, discovered the use of the MR element as a contact sensor. Because IBM at the time had a project, they called it um, Tau, Tau because of skiing. Uh, they, they put a lot of lubricant on the disc and the head was like water skiing. So they thought, okay, this should last forever. You know, reliability was always an issue. Then they said, oh, with this loop flooding, this lake of loop, things should work forever. And then there was never quite clear, is the head now flying still, or is the head um, in contact with this um, sick loop? And with the MR sensor, which I then used, so I could lower, yeah, I mean, lowering flying height at the time was difficult. You know, you only had two ways you could reduce a pressure in a pressure chamber, or you could change the RPM. So I changed RPM in that case. And then you could come down when you lower RPM, the fly height decreases. And the moment you get the frictional contact, you see the, the resistance change and you can measure it. So I could clearly show with this experiment that we're in contact with the lubricant and producing real friction. So th that, was, um, uh, that was very new, I think, to, to to prove it this directly. And I think one, one of the things I always liked is to use existing devices maybe in a different way. Because the device is already there, but typically a device has not only one function. Maybe you design it for one main function, but when you think about it, it has a lot of uh, side functions. You just need to find uh, another purpose. Yeah? And, and for the reader at the time, because it's a magnetoresistive, so the resistance changes as a function of the magnetic field, but the resistance of a metal also changes as a function of temperature. That's the on only difference, yeah. So all this was done at the Almaden Research Center? That was all done at Almaden Research, uh, yeah. And yeah. during a, a postdoc. And then, so uh, how long did that last and what did you do next? So there was, um, yeah, so when, Actually, I spent quite a, well, yeah, I mean, at the same time, I like this head disk interface really a lot. <laughs> and even, even 25 nanometers sounds high today, but at the time, that was fantastic, yeah? And coming from this AFM, STM, micro-scanning um, background, you, you had a um, respect of these spacings, yeah? And you, could it, and, and you could it in perspective, yeah? So th then there was, um, luckily, somebody else um, had already thought of it um, using a capacitance measurement. When the head flies over the disc, you can just measure, it's like two um, parallel plates almost, yeah? And then you have a capacitor. And they built these um, capacitance measurement systems at IBM in-house. So IBM had an excellent electronic uh, department. Uh, Don Horn was one of these geniuses. He built everything. Uh, I, he, he just could do anything. You ask him something and he built it, yeah. He never told you how he did it, but he built it and you got a black box that did exactly what you wanted. <laughs> so that was good. And so they had these capacitive, capacitive sensors and it was like, you know, like 40, 50 picofarad. And um, at the time, the sliders were still kind of big. You know, but my first slide I worked with was four millimeter long. Yeah, that's a huge uh, compared to today. So they could actually make um, individual little capacitors on each corner of the slider. So if this is the slider, you had just a capacitor here and here and here and here. So you had four capacitors. And then I had a four channel um, capacitance meter and what I did with this, I studied the dynamics when the head hits a TA. 
So I could see how it's uh, jumping up and then it's doing the oscillations from the air bearing damping or wiggling or when you do a shock experiment, you touch the disc. And um, so, so that's another thing I, I want to call I played with. Yeah? But it also, um, it, it helped at one point, it helped um, a program where they had uh, flying height issues. And I could use, we didn't have the sliders anymore with all these individual. So what I did is I only could measure the full capacitance. But by knowing the pitch and the ground and the camber, I could calculate the total capacitance. And when something changed, at least I could get an idea, not as accurately as I had individual sensors, but I could get a rough idea how the slider was behaving when it was doing a seek, something like that was a problem. Yeah. So, so this, and then also because you apply the voltage, you have a cooler force, attractive force. You can use this to lower the flying height. And if you apply a, a little um, voltage step function, you can study the dynamics of the slider. So it gives you just infinite opportunities to sort of play, but it's not play because you really want to understand the dynamics of the slider flying. Did IBM let you publish all this work? Yeah, or? yeah. yeah. So, um, um, oh, actually the EC, the, the, the contact thing on the ski slider, they did not, the, you know, IBM had this internal um, technical publications, so which is all confidential. This, this was not allowed to be outside published. And on the, on the capacitance, the same thing. I never published it outside. Um, I, again, for the same reason maybe before what I said is, I, I, I never feel when I do a work, I'm done. So I never feel I'm ready to publish. <laughs> I don't know where the, where the end is, you know, how much do you need to know to say this is um, now a very nice round finished piece of work. That's the, maybe the problem when other people are quicker and say, okay, I get this little piece and I publish it. And maybe not so bad, so it helps other people to get started earlier in it too. Yeah. Uh, did you have any uh, patent um, submitted um, during the oh, postdoc? The, the first time, yeah, at IBM, um, the first patent, and uh, that was like I was so proud of, <laughs> was um, people were talking about contact recording. And um, so there was Celia Yeek Scranton. Um, so contact recording means you, you want, again, like you said before, we need to fly lower and lower. So we can fly very low and hopefully not contacting the disc, but then the other extreme would be you purposely go in contact. And then there, there was an idea that we make a very tiny sliver, which was only um, 30 micrometers wide, and uh, I forgot now, 10 micrometers thick. It's, it's like, a, like a candy lever, but it was so light that the loading force on the disc was extremely small, and the idea was uh, we, we can avoid the wear and integrate the head on this. And basically, um, this would be a contact recording, a new scheme, yeah. And the, the thing, one problem was when this was um, dragging over the disc, uh, it was kind of jumping. You know, the disc wasn't super smooth, but you got all these jumps. And when you get these jumps, you cannot do the recording. And then the idea, I, I worked with Bernard Hiller on this one. He joined around the same time. And then the, our idea was, oh, we we pushing this thing, we flying backwards. So the air is coming onto it like it was an angle of attack and pushing the, the beam further on the disc. And that made it fly more stable, not fly, but uh, behave more stable. That was our first patent. And uh, we were, I, I think, yeah, the first patent is really great. <laughs> Okay, so uh, what point then did you decide or did people in the product division you know, hire you and think that? Well, first, yeah, first, the, because the work was going on well, they extended the postdoc um, for half a year. And then um, because GP also had um, good, well, I was working up in research, but part also down in the, in the product division, yeah, with Reinhard Walder, who was heading the HDI department at the time. Um, and, and somehow I, I got in touch with those people, 
And then Reinhardt thought, um, I think probably GP talked to him and said, oh, why don't we try to uh, keep him? Yeah, and then Reinhardt made uh, me an offer um, in his division for a permanent job. At the time, I had already something lined up in Germany because I was um, only prepared to stay there for a year or one and a half, yeah. So then um, I thought, okay, this is a, this is a once in a lifetime opportunity <laughs> to stay in California. And I really liked the environment, the scenery, the coast. I mean, it was hard to beat. Even Constance was beautiful. This was paradise too, <laughs> no doubt about it. Um, so I said yes, um, and, and this is how I started, but I was always planning to go back to Germany. I said, okay, I take this job now for one, two, I mean, maybe I thought about two, three years, yeah. But then it just kept on longer and longer, um, and, and, and I, I liked my work, um, this was still I, yeah, I do, like like a, a, a kid in the in the candy store sort of I felt yeah because I always um, had the freedom I could choose what I wanted to do so nobody told me how do you need to do exactly this or this this was not the case I always could pick what I wanted to do and um, it typically it, it it helped also the the program and the development and other people to to learn something so that was the good part yeah. Um, and that, that was, and I learned a lot, you know, I'm still, this IBM, th there are experts everywhere, no matter what you think of, and, and the IBM had this capability with the email, nobody, nobody else had this, you know, the bitnet. You could communicate worldwide with anyone in IBM, and universities, the universities who had IBM computers were also on the bitnet network. So that, that was another in incredible difference to everything else. Uh, so I felt the, the capability, you have a question, and then maybe you ask someone else, do you know someone expert in this area? And sure enough, there is someone, it doesn't matter whether in Yorktown Heights or in Zurich or somewhere, you always found someone. And, and that was, I mean, it was incredible, that's all I can say. And um, yeah, maybe I can talk a little bit more later when I change the job. But so till till '96, then this kept me completely happy with all my work. Yeah. Yeah. So what were the major, you know, technological issues or breakthroughs that you work on over that tenure at IBM? What uh, you were six years in this product division? So part of it was. Um, still flying height related, like I mentioned before with this capacitance measurement, there were flying height issues, it wasn't clear how the head was behaving when it was seeking fast, so I could uh, measure the dynamics of the head, uh, if it made contact with the disc or not. So that helped, and then this goes back to the air bearing designers, you know, then they have a better understanding um, what's going on. Um, I think, yeah, I worked uh, part of it with the load-unload um, scheme, you know, when you go down the ramp on the mobile drives, we use load-unload, and, and then you have certain vibrations um, where you um, want to characterize it. I worked with um, shock events, there were discussions, typically the mobile devices use glass discs because they are more uh, robust versus aluminum or Almac discs, they are softer for the normal desktop drives. And then um, one thing I really was proud of was there is this um, Wallace spacing formula. So, so basically the magnetic signal decays exponentially when you go away from the recorded track. And we use this today. This is one of our finest tools I, ha I think we have for fly height measurement in the drive. Yeah? We, we can today, we measure it to 10 picometer um, accuracy. And this fascinated me. And then again, probably a little bit with the uh, liking software and programming also, I developed what I called magnetic readback mapping. Basically, when you read back the signal from, from neighboring tracks, you, you produce an image. Yeah? You have line by line by line, like the AFM, or yeah, you, you, you have all these lines, and then you put it in a 2D plot and, and you, you have an image. And that's what I initially used when, when the head was bouncing onto the disc. It, 
on the aluminum disc, it produced an indent. And when you try to read back the signal, the signal is gone because it's too far away. Like, you know, it's decaying exponentially, so at some point it's gone. And um, I could characterize <coughs> um, the damage you get from specific shock events in terms of accurate area and data loss. And, and I remember I, when I presented this the first time, there was um, one older senior person. He got actually up and, and clapped and said, this is the, the best talk I ever saw on this subject. Yeah? Because I could quantify without going to optical instruments where you still don't have the magnetic signal um, information. I could directly say, here we lose so much amplitude or SNR, whatever you want to use as a metrics, and, and could say so, much, uh, so many bits are gone, basically. And uh, so there was, um, yeah, there was the magnetic readback, um, the way I could, I could implement it at IBM. And that probably um, leads then to other questions when I went to other companies. Why, also why I went to other companies, because I still felt at that time in IBM, the work was very departmentalized. So you, you had your area and other people had their area. Like I never, I never talked to a servo person while I was in my HDI field. I never even talked to a firmware person who did something uh, related even to HDI, yeah? because this, this was just separate. And in a way, I felt limiting um, the, the interaction, the, the, the cross-functional interaction was not, um, I felt, was not there. In, in a simple way. So that was the uh, so early 90s to mid 90s. The, right, mid 90s. Yeah. So, you know, IBM invented the disk drive, right, the RAMAC in 1955, then the big players like Hitachi, Control Data, uh, etc. But then in the, uh, in the 80s and 90s, you had all the small players like Seagate, Maxtor, yeah, yeah, Quantum, yeah. etc. They all started to uh, you know, compete with IBM. And I think IBM in that period of time actually had some very hard time competing. They were actually behind when the Synfilm disc came out. Seagate was the first one with the five and a quarter Synfilm disc. I, my first experiment was still with this 14 inch particulate media, you know, the brown media, whatever they called it. Yeah? And, and luckily, just right at this time in the early 90s, then the Synfilm disc became popular. And this is when IBM also realized this is what we need to do. Yeah. And so my, all my um, initial main work was done on the Synfilm disc. I didn't really like these big ones. They were actually scary when they were spinning. <laughs> so much energy. Too much energy. <laughs> okay, so the you know, IBM business, in the, at least on the hard disk side, you know, wasn't uh, you know, too, too healthy. And is it the reason why? And and some of the reason you're mentioning about the you know the compart you know compartmentalization of, of technology at IBM. You you left IBM. Yeah. Could you say a little more about that? And what company did you join then? Yeah. So the one thing IBM did. Um, yeah. So I joined Maxtor after this um, in '96. <coughs> and um, how do I how do you? So one thing IBM did is whenever you submitted a patent and the patent was not granted or the, the, the patent committee decided it's not worthwhile to go for a patent, they published it in, I think it was called IBM Technical Disclosure Bulletin, yeah, in a booklet. So it was published and public knowledge, nobody else could then get a patent on it. So this is how they protected this. Yeah, it, they didn't want to go for the patent because it cost a lot of money, but they published it and and this IBM technical disclosure bulletin, this was full of all these things that were not considered good enough for a patent, but there was so much knowledge in this, like Encyclopedia Britannica for this drive. <laughs> and other people outside IBM, they looked at those, yeah? And they were, that's what I learned when I left. So first of all, when I left is I realized, oh, there are smart people out there too. There was, um, in, in, in Maxtor were people from, from 
other companies were. This was just a mix of all kinds of other company people. Yeah, and every company does things in a little bit a different way. But clearly, these people were not oblivious what IBM was doing because there were patents, there were these publications, and 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 they were. I felt they were faster in implementing the ideas from IBM. And, and there was, um, yeah, I mean, there was clearly an advantage. And, and for me, so one big difference was going from IBM. All I did in IBM was spin stand work, which was excellent for the learning phase. Yeah? But at some point, um, you also want to see how does a real drive work. And this was the opportunity I had at Maxdoor. So there, <coughs> we, Maxdoor actually did not really have, they had for solo writing, there were the Guzics, but, <coughs> and for, for some, you know, recording um, ADC, aerial density um, evaluation, there was the Guzik as a, as a tester. But everything else we did in the drive. So the drive was our tester. And uh, that was a really, uh, I still remember just seeing the first drive connected to the computer. At, a, at that time, you could still open the top cover and the drive was still working. <laughs> it's not falling apart or not working because the, the track density is so high now and you deform everything. So you could open the top cover, you had it connected to the computer, and you just type seek. Seek from cylinder zero to maybe, was only maybe 30,000 at the time, and then you flip it, went to the ID. And just seeing this simple mechanical motion fascinated me. Yeah? And, and that, that just gave me a lot of uh, new ideas what, what I could do. So <clears throat> initially, I should say, initially I wasn't really planning to leave IBM. I, I felt IBM was a little bit behind in the pay scale. Yeah? So IBM was an excellent company because they provided um, lifetime uh, employment yeah so you got at maybe, the time <laughs> yeah at the time yeah but when i joined they had the first layoff you know i think in 93 which was a shock for all the people but before there was generations of people were working at ibm you know the dad was working the son or daughter or it, yeah because you ibm didn't lay off people <clears throat> and maybe but uh, clearly, at some point, the salary was not as competitive. And because money was tight, I was sort of got a hint from my manager uh, who said, look, I cannot really increase easily. But if you come with an offer from outside, then we can work on it. Yeah. Then I thought, OK, um, I can maybe do that. And at that time, people had already left from IBM <coughs> um, to, to Maxdoor, among others. So I went to Maxdoor, and Tadashi was one of the people also, and I went to Maxdoor initially only to kind of get an offer, you know, and, and maybe go back. Negotiate. Uh, but I tell you, the moment I walked into Maxdoor and talked to people after like half an hour or an hour, I knew that this was the place I want to work. And there was no, there was no way back for me to IBM. I thought, as long as Maxdoor is giving me a decent offer, I'm, I'm done, yeah, <clears throat> and that's exactly what happened. So, I saw the, I I just saw immediately the opportunities I could have in Maxdoor, with with my expertise where I could contribute, yeah, and and that just made me very excited. And then I went to back to IBM, and you know how things work. Then then they immediately give you a, a new opportunity. But it's too late. Once you made up your mind, it's actually a lot of pain. Most people know when you look for a new job and you work for a company you like, it gives you sleepless nights. Yeah. So once you're over this, you're really done. <laughs> so then I joined Maxdoor, and this was, <clears throat> I think, still the 10, 10 best years. I mean, there's the time with you in IBM in the research area, then that was great too. But this was clearly uh, 10 solid years, um, maybe eight, because in the end it wasn't so great either. But the, the work environment, the no barriers among departments. I, I could talk to anyone, there, and nobody felt offended. If I come to the civil per person and say, 
oh, um, how about can we change this or can we do this? Or they come to us, HDI, and say, why, why do we need to do this? Yeah, so we talk about it. And I, um, that was hard to beat, this interaction. So tell me about some of the technical innovation you worked on and you implemented. So in, here's the thing then, this magnetic readback mapping, what I said before, <coughs> there was, um, I was limited then on the spin stand. So when I, when I went to MacStore, I could, um, we, we hired a firmware engineer in our group, and I implemented this same technique in the drive. And this became, uh, I'm still proud of this one, this became the major FA tool in the drive before you tear it down. So many times you didn't even need to tear it down because with this magnetic readback mapping, you could see what HDI problems were happening on the disk. You could see scratches, dings, magnetic erasures, all these things you could study even without taking taking the thing apart. And then we we developed. Um, there was actually uh, um, Jack Tsai came up um, with this idea. We developed the magnetic marking where you have a problem on the disk, and then you put magnetic um, certain patterns around it, and then you can tear it down and uh, inspect it with other tools. You know, like the Candela surface analysis tools or, or AFM. But the, the, magnetic, um, the magnetic readback mapping was um, a superb tool before you tear it down. And, and one other thing which only I could, have, could do at MacStore, because we had the firmware support, there was no limitation. At that time, you may remember we used the uh, laser bumps at the ID because the head was landing on the disk. And to avoid the stiction, we needed this corrugation basically on the media. And this was done with laser bumps, <coughs> also invented at IBM, yeah? Well, many things were invented Actually, at IBM. you know, Seagate. Seagate did the first? That's the original laser texture pattern. Oh, I didn't know Raji, that. Raji Ranjan, oh, uh, I didn't know. with some CMU people, as yeah, a matter of fact. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So what, what we did, see, Maxtor was uh, not making their own disks and own heads like IBM. IBM had a head, disk, preamp, channel, everything in-house, yeah? Um, so we had to buy them from vendors, and people very often said, oh, this is, uh, Maxtor is not really a great company because they just buy these component, components and put them together. It's much more difficult to put these different components together and, and make it work, you know, with all the variation each one has. So we got laser disks from different uh, vendors, obviously, and each vendor had their own way of doing the bumps, and they all had their own shapes and densities. And sometimes there were issues <coughs> in the drive with the laser bumps, so I could use the the magnetic readback mapping by extending normally without firmware change, you cannot go in this landing zone. So I asked our firmware person, can we extend the thermo to the ID? And we could, and then we could map the laser bumps with the magnetic readback signal. And I, I published actually that one. So, and there is a direct comparison of AFM trace and Wallace spacing trace, and it's identical, yeah? So again, Without tearing down the drive, taking the disk out, inspecting the laser bumps, we could measure it um, in, 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 the, in the full drive and, and draw our conclusions. So the, the magnetic readback mapping became, a, for Maxtor, it became a major tool. And obviously there is a lot of <coughs> uh, work needs to be done when you do it in the drive, because each drive is different, you know, the, the newer drive have different parameters, so there, there were actually at least one person always involved in upgrading the tool for being compatible with the new programs. But that was a, yeah, I think I was very proud with, with, that, um, with that technique. Yeah. So, um, so at the time, again, you had you know all these small companies that became big, right? Seagate, uh, Connor Peripherals, Quantum, yeah, yeah. Maxtor. Uh, some of them were vertically integrated, like Seagate. 
uh, and some of them were not like Mac Store. And I think at the end, you know, there was always the, you know, the discussion, you know, should we get vertically integrated or not? Um, and I think Mac Store actually started to do their own media, their own discs with uh, Mac Yeah, when media. they bought, uh, yeah, yeah, right, Comag. Um, but at the end, so did, did Ma was Mac Store successful and did they flourish as a company or did they get through some hard times? And, and if they did, we went why through, do you think? No, we recovered. <coughs> so when I joined, uh, Mike Cannon was the CEO and I think he, what they call a turnaround CEO, yeah, he definitely brought the company back into, I think it was profit, yeah. The, um, the, yeah, so here in California, we had all these technologies and, and uh, Longmont was the, the production part, yeah, the develop, the real drive development and we did more technology and at some point, I think the Longmont people complained and said, oh, these people just play around here, yeah, and, and then Pendelis at the time was the CTO. So we then also developed um, uh, drive programs. And one program we did was uh, actually a, a thinner build height, not one inch. It was, uh, I think, 17 millimeter height only, which is always a tricky thing when you introduce a new form factor. You know, usually um, that is not so welcome. <clears throat> but the, the argument on this drive, and this was successful from all I know, actually very successful. It was only a single bladder drive and only one surface was used. And, and the benefit of this was we only needed one head and that makes it cheaper. The head is an expensive component. And <coughs> we could do this because at that time we had the highest aerial density in the drive. So with one surface we could you know, there is this, what they call the sweet spot in the capacity. The market always has a certain <coughs> capacity of the disk drive at a, at a certain time is um, favored. Yeah, it's the main thing that people buy. And with this one surface and the highest aerial density, we could actually hit this sweet spot. And the design um, was just um, sort of ingenious, I would say, because the the head was so you could build it, there was the base plate, then you put the head in, it was on the bottom, and the head was actually facing up, then you put the disc on top of it, and then you screw it down, and that was it, yeah? The, the top surface of the disc was unused, and this was so simple, and it was also simple for experiments, because you could just easily swap out the disc, put a new one in, or took the head out and put a new one in, this was such a beautiful um, drive design for experimental purposes also. We, we just all loved it, yeah. And um, they, they then made it more efficient because only one surface was used. They processed two disks in parallel. So they put them back to back <coughs> and deposit, basically treated it like a single disk. And I always thought, how do they get this thing apart? But somehow this worked that you you can pry it apart fairly easily, actually, without bending them, yeah. But that was good for, so you treat them like a single disc, but you got two pieces out of it. That was um, a successful um, project. And then what happened at Maxtor is then this, I still think Maxtor invented, I mean, we, we have the original patent for the TFC, the Soma Fly Height um, Control. And um, we, we worked on the implementation, and this was also, um, I'm, I'm proud to be part of this team, to be mainly, um, uh, uh, I was mainly tasked with how can we integrate this TFC into the drive, you know, what kind of um, power control do we need to make the fly height and time constants characterization, so that's what, what I did in, in my team, all these um, sumo mechanical um, uh, evaluations, and also the integration, what the preamp needs to be doing in the end, how to control the feature. That, that was, um, I mean, that was uh, activity. Initially, it was thought, um, discussing it 
That was not my idea, but the VP thought we can do all this in six months. <laughs> and then it took like, that was like two and a half years and or so, years. yeah. But was Max Dor the first one to ship? No, unfortunately no. not. So Max Dor went for the, for the full luxury implementation where we wanted to um, control in situ the flying high. And we thought we had everything protected, this uh, technology with our vendor. Yeah. So here's maybe the disadvantage, you need to talk to a vendor. If you don't make your own head, you need to talk to someone. And the moment you talk to someone, easily they talk to someone else. Very quickly yeah. the whole world. Yeah. Yeah. Very quickly the whole world knows it. I don't know how Apple keeps their secrets, but that's what it is. And then Seagate beat us to it because they went for the simpler Im implementation. Yeah, th the problem is once you go to a lower flying height, the, the manufacturing of the slider has tolerances. So when you go to like 10 nanometer, it's becoming very tough to go to seven nanometer and have a reasonable yield where all heads fly at seven nanometer. And this was actually the big um, benefit of the fly height adjust. Suddenly you could um, use all kinds of, basically a wide range of the heads fabricated you could use because you could make up for the variation with your fly height adjust. And Seagate did a um, uh, very simple um, implementation where they basically took the high flying heads, they adjusted a fixed value and brought it down. And that was it, you know, there was no um, interactive um, or, or ongoing control. And that helped already a lot and this was the first implementation and we were uh, I think we were probably uh, uh, half a year or three quarters of a year later with our better implementation. And unfortunately at that time was also a decision made that the product, this was a mobile product, was um, not needed and it was not good for the market at the time. Later on it turned out it would have been very good, but these are the decisions um, that sometimes come out and um, from various marketing um, evaluations <coughs> and then they turn out they're not right, yeah. So we, we in the end we we had built the mobile drive with the full TFC fly height adjust control but that did not become the, the product. Uh, so Ehart, we talked a little bit about Mac Store and the transition from uh, you know desktop computing to uh, mobile computing and the transition from you know three and a half inch disk drive to uh, to two and a half um, and so you, you mentioned that Mac store you know wasn't too didn't do the transition um, quickly enough could you talk some more about this I mean <coughs> I don't know if I should say that did I mean we had the desktop uh, programs we had uh, mobile programs we also did, I think IBM was actually the first one with like the micro drive. Um, we did this and um, I wouldn't say, I probably do not have enough knowledge what exactly um, would have been the ideal um, transition or speed for different products. Yeah. I mean, it seems like even the marketing um, team did not exactly know what is the best fit at that time for the market. All I know is we, um, I think from the, from our desktop drives, the products were, were well received. The, this 17-inch, um, I told you, this one disc was um, this was a good success, and there was a follow-up. I think we had there yeah, two flavors like this. Then the two and a half inch, unfortunately, um, never became a product. Yeah, this is was at that time when Maxdo was then. Um, oh, then we we merged with Quantum, you know, at some point, and. Um, I probably shouldn't say too much because there is a lot of politics going on with it, but I can at least from my engineering side, I can say Quantum had um, the server drives, they had already worked on a, on a 
small one inch uh, was maybe a 1.7 inch drive, a small drive. Where we saw it with the merger, we, yeah, when people always say one plus one is more than one, the synergy thing, which rarely works, yeah. I, I felt um, we, we were promised, oh, with the merger, we have now this much bigger variety in drives. And it didn't take long, one after another of these programs was canceled, yeah. And again, the background to this, uh, other people know clearly better what the financial reasoning was and, and all the marketing reason, I cannot s speak to that one. But initially it looked like, yes, this is a good enhancement for Maxdoor, and it turned out it, it was not, yeah. So w were, there, were there, you know, bad? bad days then in you know in technology uh, and you know you left Mac store after a while even though that was one of the best places you you worked well, in yeah with that because uh, business was was right yeah. I mean in the end it got bought by Seagate and um, some of us had the option to join Seagate in other locations but most people I don't even know if anyone took this offer I mean you could have gone to Longmont or Minneapolis um, so I decided I don't want to move yeah and that's where I yeah that, uh, that was the funny part that's where I thought <laughs> okay maybe I go back to IBM which by that time I think it was was it then Hitachi I forgot actually yeah HGST or the yeah. HGST and uh, yes HGST and so I went back to to still I we can call it IBM. It's still the same, same people, same, <laughs> same everything. And this was exactly what it was. I come back from Maxdoor, where I felt things worked fast. Yeah, you can. Things had a sense of urgency. <laughs> and then I'm not saying. So it was uh, okay. I did we carefully as a record. So it was definitely different. In it was different coming back from Max to, to HST at the time or the IBM, and it was it had not changed. It was nice for me to meet all the same people. You felt home right away again, and and uh, I think uh, we were welcome. They recognized <laughs> us. <laughs> And I just felt after a while, I don't know, uh, this is not exactly, um, I got used to another work style and, and then I felt, uh, I think it was only here like nine months. Then this opportunity came up with Headway. And Headway, so I didn't know much about Headway. I knew that Headway was, um, because we worked with them from Mexico too, Headway was simply um, a head manufacturer component um, company. And I joined Headway, um, I worked there a total of four years. But after two years, it's a component company, so you only focus on one piece. And my responsibility was like um, reader reliability. Yeah. And I noticed pretty soon that I'm missing the entire drive. So after like two years, I felt this is not this is not uh, ideal and um, I was about to to leave but then I the option opportunity came up in headway um, starting the hammer project the heat assisted magnetic recording and so that was um, brought to me and uh, they said oh yeah if you want to maybe do this work this is new and um, we can do some kind of a research um, activity here. And the people thought this, this is what I like, and that is true, that's what I like. So I said, okay, yes, I, I stay and I do this hammer thing. So I did set up the hammer lab, <coughs> hired people, um, and I had the opportunity, I mean, the, the benefit was TDK, you know, Headway and TDK were also working together. The TDK already had worked on Hammer for longer, and they actually had already made uh, quite nice um, um, progress. So I did not um, start Hammer from scratch overall. I could benefit from the Headway uh, work they did already. 
but I, I brought obviously um, new ideas to to the to the pro program or to the project, I should say, and it was clearly super interesting. Yeah, and I must say, <coughs> headway by itself. So when I take um, IBM pace-wise, you know, how, how I felt it, you know, and I'm not speaking for other people, how I felt about it. I saw the pace um, was um, increasing from IBM to Maxdoor to Headway. So Headway was, um, I was impressed, and only because I maybe saw it closer, Headway was a smaller company, so the people who did the wafer processing and all this were also closer to me, so I, I could see how they work. And my impression was the the speed, how they tried different uh, wafer flavors layout, you know, head variations, was just incredible how fast this went. Now I cannot completely speak for IBM because I never at IBM, like I told you before, I was the HDI person, I had no business to really get involved with the wafer people or anyone else, yeah, this was separate. So um, that, that was impressive how fast Headway worked and when they decided to do the hammer activity, I, I think the way I see it is when Headway, when they decide to do something, they do it 100%, not, not halfway, let's see how things go. So there was money available. Um, I remember one case where I went to a trade show in San Francisco and they had an, um, an optical, um, a near field optical microscope. It was like, I forgot, 250K. I, I came back in the evening to Headway and talked to the president and I said this would be really helpful for us and the next day I could buy it, yeah. So there, there was, it was a small company. There was no um, bureaucracy involved. And you, that was just fantastic. So we set up this um, Hammer Lab. And what I brought, still my interest, was still either spin stand or disk drive. Yeah? And we set up a Hammer tester and um, hammer head evaluation, how you quantify the light quality and the intensity. And at the beginning, you know, these hammer heads only lasted milliseconds. So that was all you got to work with. And <clears throat> my goal was um, to actually make the, we had a hammer disc from also from a vendor, Shoadenko, to be able to sobo write with a hammerhead, a hammer disc, because nobody knew if this is actually working, yeah, how this would go. And it was, a, I would say, a um, um, reasonable um, long pass to do that, but in the end, um, my team, or we accomplished the hammer solo riding, and there was at a time where <coughs> the, the lead from TDK, the hammer lead, he was also very frustrated at the time about the progress. You know, when you think about it, I think um, Seagate started 2003 on Hammer, yeah. So it's a long time and we still, still don't have the product today. So it, it is a very slow progress overall. He was frustrated and he, we, we just actually accomplished this solo riding and um, he didn't know at the time, he just arrived in San Francisco. There was a quarterly meeting where everyone got together. That's the way they did it. And on the way back, um, I told him, oh, we can do the silver riding now. And that's where he, he also felt like this was a great milestone for the hammer progress, yeah, to at least see that things are working this far. And um, for me, <coughs> there was, um, there was my personal um, milestone. There were things going on where I also became less and less happy with Headway because I still missed the drive, yeah? And even the HEI, the tester, the things I built up, it wasn't, it wasn't so appreciated um, in this environment because there was not the, the full drive um, knowledge need behind, yeah? This was the component. Usually Headway gives you the component as a drive integrator and says, you 
you tell me now, is it working for you or not? Yeah. So that was still different. And, and after <coughs> that time, I, I, again, I felt I'm missing the drive. I need to do something else. But I, I'm not a quitter. I usually finish what I start. And this was my milestone. And after we accomplished this solo riding, I felt like, OK, that's a time. Yes, I took a, a time out there, <laughs> sabbatical then. <laughs> Uh, you, you, uh, sorry to interrupt, but you mentioned that Seagate started in 2003, but I think Seagate started when they acquired Quinta, which was 1998. So oh, even earlier. Yeah, so the you Quinta acquisition by Seagate was in 98, which actually led... But the did they, so this is where they also had the hammer thought, you mean? The so Quinta was, you know, heat assisted. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah. You know, near field. Uh, and by yeah, the way, that was okay. a demise so of it's even uh, Al Sugard yeah. got fired by <coughs> the board uh, at oh, because over of this? that, because he oh. spent way too much money. <laughs> <laughs> That's one of the reasons. <laughs> but that was 98, so here 98 we are even. 24 okay, years good. later, yeah, and right. Hammer is still not in a product, and we're going to yeah. talk about that a little later in the, yeah, in the discussion. You're, you're right, so it's even longer. Okay, good. But so, yeah, so... Um, Frustrated that you had, you know, you really wanted to, uh, you know, put your hands more on the finished product, the disk drive, mm -hmm. and so you joined um, HDSD. Yeah, again. Then, yeah. So you you called me or we got in touch, and you you offered me this um, opportunity, uh, joining maybe the research environment, your group, and and that was uh, really very intriguing again because I felt like, yeah, this is great. Um, this is what I. What I'm, what I like, you know, the the variety of activities. So <coughs> then, yeah, I mean, and that worked out well. So I, I would say, looking back, Headway, I I have, um, I only can compliment Headway the the intensity, the oh yeah, I should mention this. Initially, it was like described, oh Erhard, here's a researchy project, the hammer, yeah. And it didn't take too long where they thought, this research is, <laughs> is maybe not what we really want. <laughs> when can this be in a product? <laughs> yeah. And then, then the pressure started building up, you know, that you had your weekly progress meetings and the hammer was slow. That's what I'm saying. So it's very tough every week to say, what is the progress? Yeah, there was sometimes no progress, and I hated this. Yeah, how did you feel about coming to a company that um, Hitachi or HGST uh, started very late in Hammer? Uh, I think part of the IBM legacy was maybe steering the technology more into pattern media, which also went yeah. nowhere when yeah. Seagate was uh, you know, going into the heat-assisted recording. So you came to uh, IBM Hitachi slash WD, um, we, which had just started, as a matter of fact, we asked you to actually s spearhead the, right. you know, at least part of the Hammer program. And so did you feel that the, we were way behind or did you feel, or did, did you uh, have at the At the beginning, really, it clearly it was way behind because li like I said, I left the company headway where we did the sober riding or we had already a fully integrated head, which was done by, C uh, by uh, TDK at the time, yeah. So, uh, you, yes, when I joined your team, <coughs> and yeah, I, I think my focus was we, we spearheaded the HDI and, and some mechanical um, uh, work. It was way behind. But also, I still liked the hammer because, um, first of all, there were many naysayers who said this is never going to work. And, and I always felt like, no, it, it can work, you know, and uh, part of it was basically disproving all of these people. But um, that it's so hard um, to get the technology into a product, I, I think um, many people are surprised by it, yeah. I still, I still think it's a, it's a viable pass, but obviously we, we suddenly encountered, um, I mean, it's completely different, this HDI. <laughs> Uh, environment with 400, 500 degree media temperature, 200 whatever something degree in the head. I mean, it's we hate temperature, <laughs> and here you do the worst thing you can think of, yeah. And then you say, oh, make it work for five years or whatever. <laughs> so it was. But the nice thing about this was, 
um, joining joining your team, I mean, I knew things can at least go this far already, yeah. And and this is this there was not um, a secret. It's not. It wasn't like I, I brought like a, a lot of unknown things we could do, yeah. It was simply hard work. You were at the beginning of making integrated heads, <coughs> and. Um, we started, um, luckily, we very early got integrated heads and other people who worked a little bit earlier worked with the external um, recording, you know, external free beam. And um, that was even more cumbersome. So luckily, there was a, already a good progress. Even the lifetime was not really fantastic. So that was 2011. That it was 2011. So it's 11 years ago. Um, do you yeah. think Hammer, and we still don't have a Hammer drive, at least that I can go and buy today. I know there are Hammer drives now in customers' hands that you know Seagate is touting and perhaps uh, WD also. Um, so I think Seagate in some of the uh, investors' uh, call uh, said that the technology is ready, but they're waiting to, to the 30 terabyte per this drive yeah. uh, density point to ship it. W uh, what do you think? And, and I know it kind of, you know, perhaps some information is confidential that you cannot say. But as far as you know, the technology goes, no, uh, just well, um, yeah. On, on the bigger picture, <coughs> um, we don't have all the details from Seagate. We, we obviously we would love to get one of their drives to look at it. Um, what, what is interesting, uh, you probably also would agree, many times when you see competitors do something, uh, what we say in Germany, they also cook with water. Yeah, It's, it's rare, I, I cannot even um, uh, uh, cite a case where you suddenly take something from the competitor and look at it and say, oh, this is fantastic, we never thought about this. Typically, it's all incremental improvements and here a tweak and there a tweak and it makes it better overall. Yeah, We had the same with <coughs> when we merged with Quantum. I remember the case, there was always the rumor, oh, Quantum has higher aerial density, they have a better channel efficiency, whatever. When we merged with them, they set up task forces or one task force to look into all these details. There was nothing standing out what they did differently. It, it was all little incremental improvements that made it overall better. And so maybe the same thing could be with, there's clearly one thing when you go from hammer, when you go from spin stand to a drive, things work differently. You know, there are surprises on the spin stand. You don't have the same maybe sobo pattern. And, and in the, it's just different um, how, how the physics then works. But in the end, you can explain it, yeah, um, most of the things. So <coughs> the, why is the hammer not a product today? The, the, the simple take is getting high aerial density is still a challenge. And the, when you look at the papers in the projection, <coughs> the people think four terabit per square. So remember today we are around one terabit, 1.1 with PMR yeah, or EPMR, the um, en uh, energy assist PMR. So 1.1, let's say, terabit per square inch, and Hammer is on the granular media, supposedly go to four terabit per square inch. But today, to at least my understanding is the Seagate drive is, I would say, well below, well below 1.5 terabit per square inch. The Hammerhead is more expensive. So if you don't get enough aerial density, you need to put in still all these heads and disks and then there is no no cost savings. So what do you do with this? Then you just stick. Look, we just announced, which I found impressive, um, WD, I don't know if you saw it, we just announced 26 terabyte drive. This is SMR, shingled magnetic recording. The same, the same technology in non-shingle is 22. So that is actually pretty nice. And uh, shingled magnetic recording <coughs> is Finally, after many, many years, it seems like it's becoming more accepted. It's getting more accepted by the customers because also the, the performance has improved, you know, the algorithm. 
So it comes down to the aerial density. Even Seagate has um, demoed on spin stand aerial density. Um, I think if you take everything into account, maybe 2.4 terabit per square inch, which is really nice. With hammer? With hammer, which is really nice. But this is not, from all I and we understand, this is not what's in the drive. Yeah. So, and, and then there is always this compromise in hammer between <coughs> um, performance and lifetime, and you need both in the product. Yeah. So, do you think hammer it's ever going to be um, uh, absolutely. out there in the I, market? I, I, I think absolutely. And um, why do I say this? <coughs> One thing is, I believe in the engineering, engineering talents. Um, I think we, we have. In, um, and I say this, I think in all companies we have excellent engineers. And if they get the right resources and time and put their mind to it, they can solve the problems, yeah. So I, I, I believe strongly in this capability of our engineers. So it, it will work, it will work. Is it, yeah, how quickly Obviously, it already <coughs> took way, way longer than anyone expected. I mean, how often did Seagate, not to blame Seagate, but uh, the point is still, how often did they announce we will have the product by end of the year? Yeah, w way too long, because there were always other issues. And um, But in the end, it's probably, I believe Seagate has managed most of the... Um, problems of the hammer interface in the drive, but it's still the aerial density that needs to come up to make it viable. You know, some people might say perpendicular recording was also a laboratory curiosity for yeah. a long time yeah. before, you know, time was ripe to uh, implement it into a product, which, which, you know, we did in 05 or 06. And this is so radical, the hammer, you know, it's, it's a change, it's, it's you, I mean, Tell me another example <coughs> where the drive undergoes such an extreme change. And even the MR, how long was the MR in development at IBM? I, I saw there was at least eight years or something. In MR heads, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Took, took a very long time. So, it, yeah, it's probably one of the longest projects, Hammer. But there is also, look, we call it um, EPMR. <coughs> the, there's the memo on the other side and the uh, energy exists, uh, the energy PMR is something in between, you know, it, it, it still helps to improve the aerial density today, but not by not by 1x or 2x, 3x, yeah, it, it's going slowly, but it still helps to increase it until the hammer will be kicking in. So your heart, in uh, what, almost two hours we went all the way from your childhood to uh, to today, yeah. uh, including your 40 some years in, in your HDD head, uh, hard disk carrier. So reflecting back in uh, your achievements in the disk drive business and, and looking at all your inventions and innovations, uh, can you tell us which invention you're the proudest of and uh, and perhaps uh, which inventions you've had that ac that you're very proud of that actually never made it to uh, to a product. Yeah, <laughs> Sorry, come back. Uh, don't they like my random numbers, which yeah. never made <laughs> in the product? Thank you. Let's talk about it. <coughs> random numbers was a very interesting project at Maxtor. Um, typically, we talk about. SNR signal to noise in the disk drive, so you, you you want to read your bits back, but there's a lot of noise around it, so you need to um, spend quite an effort to extract the signal you want from all the noise. And then <coughs> I thought, oh, with all the noise, maybe we can the noise we can use the noise for something else, and the something else would be random numbers, because random numbers are a key for encryption technologies. So there is a good use for random numbers. And random numbers are used in, in a variety of fields, you know, experiments, physics. Um, so random numbers is, is a good thing. <coughs> and making, making real random numbers versus pseudo random numbers. So you can do mathematical algorithms that produce you strings that um, also look like random numbers 
but it's still if you start with the same seed you get the same string and that is different from the real random numbers uh, the real random numbers is just the nature which um, which makes every time it's different and <clears throat> here was the the thought was let's use this noise from the read back from the read channel and see how much noise can we or how can we convert this noise in a in a random number sequence and um I was lucky at the time <clears throat> there was a, a former friend um, in Germany who was working on random numbers. Um, he had some interest in it at least and he had uh, just a sabbatical um, opportunity. So I could invite him to Maxdoor and we worked on this random number project. And in the end <clears throat> we were able to, to use the disk drive to produce um, a reasonable good bandwidth, like 500 kilobits per second, in in random number stream, and the idea was that the disk drive is um, is really suitable for this because first of all, it can um, produce random numbers, and if you need a faster bit stream, so first you can buffer all your random numbers on the drive. It's already a storage device. So whenever the drive is idling, <coughs> it could produce these random numbers and put it in a, <coughs> a certain area on the disk. And when you need then, suddenly you have a high demand, you can just pull it off with your, with your super high uh, read uh, bandwidth. So <coughs> that's what we, what we demonstrated. And so I, I learned a little bit about random numbers and there is at least an um, anecdote, I, uh, actually two funny anecdotes um, I would want to say. While we were working on the random numbers, um, suddenly there was a New York Times article <laughs> about, <laughs> yeah, I still need to laugh, it's so funny, about the lava lamp. So most people know this lava lamp where you have this um, two-phase liquid and, and it's like a, a bubble coming up and changing the shape and then going down due to the convection. There's the heat lamp underneath. So this seemingly chaotic system, someone took um, and uh, exploited it to extract the random numbers with, um, I forgot now, but I think it was one bit per minute. It was really extremely slow. But it made this New York Times article, and, and we worked on our disk drive random numbers with 500 kilobits, <laughs> and nobody noticed. <laughs> so we thought that was really funny. <laughs> and then this was during the dot-com time, where you had startups that came out like wheat everywhere. <laughs> so <laughs> there was a startup in Florida which came up with this new compression algorithm, which was like 10 times better than you know the zip the zip compression algorithm we use here, and they well, forgot seven or ten times better. So they, that's what they announced. <coughs> and we invited the person, because if you can compress your data stream, that is proportional to your bandwidth. If I can compress my data stream 5x, I have the 5x of the data stream. This is just very intriguing for, for everyone who processes, uh, who works with data streams. Yeah. So <clears throat> the person came out and gave a presentation, and um, no matter how much you understood from the from his presentation, what we understood were our random numbers, and and the random number one key property of a random number is you cannot compress it. <laughs> so no way. And we we had this uh, we had our data stream, <clears throat> and we made a disk with 100 megabyte, which is reasonable. In theory, even if I give you a hundred megabyte, you don't know if this is a real random number because this may be just it. If I give you two hundred megabyte, it may be just as a repeat from the hundred megabyte. So you never can be sure if your random number is a real random number. You can have a high probability, but the sequence, the length, you never can be sure. But a hundred megabyte was definitely a good number um, for him to work with. So we gave him the CD and said, okay, take it home compress it, send it back to us, and we never heard again from him. <laughs> so that was really, I, I like this project because it still, again, made use, kind of a secondary use of the disk drive, but you had already all the components there, 
and, um, and it worked quite well. Disappointing part was we really thought that this could be um, enhanced the Maxtor product at the time because now you can tell the customer, here you get for free random numbers. You could buy, I think even today, you can buy hardware random numbers, um, computer chips you can add to your uh, PC and it's a real random number source and um, um, some of them use very often people quote radioactive decay yeah, which is real random but you can use electronic noise in from diodes junction noise whatever and extract like we did the the noise is not a perfect random number you need to do some <coughs> processing and um, throw away the no good parts of the signal but then you still end up with a, a reasonable high uh, percentage of good noise, yeah. And um, so, we, yeah, we, we thought this is nice for the Maxto product and we can add this feature. It's basically free because all you need to do is this little firmware change. Yeah? And then a marketing, I never forget this, said, we don't want the Maxto drives to be different. <laughs> We both sat there uh, and said, okay, <laughs> what is that now? Yeah, And today I, I heard this actually not only from at that time, I hear this many times because um, the one thing is, if you offer a new feature in your drive, the customer usually doesn't want one source. The customer wants multiple sources because I could suddenly run into a problem. Our manufacturing could be in an earthquake area and suddenly manufacturing is down, so we cannot deliver our drive. So the customer needs to have an uh, escape route. Yeah? So that's why they like that all the different flavors from different um, sources are the same. So that's the thinking they have. Yeah? But on the other side, you would say, if you build a product with a new feature, so be it you in the lead, the other people will follow. Maybe a few months later, they can do the same thing. And then it's again on par with each other. So <coughs> point is, um, it, it never, it, we thought, yeah, back to a random number, um, the best way if you want to encrypt anything is what they call a one-time pad. That means um, any, any um, text or information will be will be um, encrypted with exactly basically the same the same amount of random data so you need the point is if you have a lot of data to encrypt you need a lot of random data because you you just use them up it's like you use them and that's it so if if i have a hundred megabyte of random data and i use a one-time pad I can only encrypt 100 megabyte of data, that's it. So the need for a large supply of random data, we saw clearly there, yeah. But um, obviously um, it, it wasn't, it, it wasn't, um, I think it, it shouldn't say good enough, it wasn't um, different enough from uh, pseudo random numbers because <coughs> for most, here we go, for most practical purposes, a pseudo random number is as good. I cannot tell you from from a hundred megabyte string if this is a pseudo random number generated string or a real random, I cannot, yeah. So this is where maybe the argument for many people is, my pseudo random numbers are just fine, even I could run in the case where I use the same seed and I get the same sequence. But uh, that, that's just it, yeah. So that was a good thing. So conversely, uh, of your 100 plus uh, patents, uh, which one do you think had the most impact uh, in, a, in a business, uh, hard disk business? Um, did I, yeah. This is, uh, this is actually, put, um, Many of the patents are part of, they, they solve part of the problems in the drive. There is, I don't think, do I have now uh, one where I, I don't think I have one patent where I would say this made the drive 
work. Without this, it wouldn't be the drive. Yeah? I don't have a pattern like this. Most patterns are, again, incremental improvements to the drive technology, which, um, which helps the drive to be better, but it's not a go-no-go -no -go pattern. I mean, a, I would say a really very valuable pattern is the, the summer fly height control, the summer fly height adjust. The, the way, <clears throat> actually, the way this came all about on the Maxwell side is we were in a in a in a room, and we were thinking, brainstorming about um, fly height control, and in the end, we we had two left um, two two technologies left. One was piezoelectric. And one was the thermal, and so we. I voted for the. I, I was stronger on the piezoelectric. I saw the piezoelectric is actually. Um, I could see the piezoelectric actuation a more suitable um, system than the thermal, with the slowness and everything. But this is so. I was on the pattern with the piezo, and other people were on the pattern with the TFC. If I had been on the TFC, I would tell you easy the TFC, yeah, because clearly the TFC um, fly high control makes the drive today. So without TFC, no matter if the thermal or if it's an other system, the drive wouldn't be what it is today. That is for sure, yeah. But what it also says, <coughs> even the the thermal fly high control. When you look at the initial dynamics, the way it works, you wouldn't say this is the ideal way of doing it. That's why I saw the piezo with its fast actuation and, and the low power consumption. You know, the piezo is like a capacitor. Yeah, the thermal, um, what today maybe we we consume 50 milliwatts, and, and power consumption today is an is an issue. So the the thermal fly height control has many. Um, you can bring up arguments saying it's not ideal. But here we go. Once the people put their mind to it, they make it work. And the way it's integrated today, the overall system, it, it just works very well. Yeah. So th this is another good lecture or, or I think case where you have multiple choices and which one you pick, it's not you need to pick one to make progress. That's the key. Yeah? But very often, yes, you can sometimes say, oh, I picked this one. Oh, it's so painful. I don't know if you should continue. You most likely succeed if you put enough engineering power behind it. And, and, and turning after 50%, turning around and switching to the other is probably not the best solution. Yeah. So you always, and I think this is my dilemma with, um, with ideas or you you always have multiple solutions and picking the key is picking one making a decision is better than making no decision <laughs> i think that's it yeah like you said the thermal flyer control there's a seminal patent uh, max store <laughs> seminal patent but then it takes you know another 100 invention to actually make it work and yeah uh, so there, there is one from um dallas meyer um, from seagate it's a patent it was a little bit different. Um, basically, when this is the slider, we, we know the summer fly height produces this little bulge here in the read-write area. And uh, the, the Dallas Meyer pattern puts some heater in kind of in the middle of the slider and, and changes the ground. Yeah, And that also causes fly height change. But now, uh, now there are things um, from what we understand from the interface, you know, even, let's say, I had a perfectly ideal slider, um, and now we're flying, let's say, 10 nanometer. Now I bring it down to one nanometer. The funny thing is, that will not work, because now I have such a large area coming in contact, and the Van der Waals forces would basically collapse my, my air bearing. Yeah? So even, um, well, maybe people, this was not the purpose why the thermal was introduced, yeah. But luckily today we know the thermal only produces a small area, which uh, so that means the Van der Waals force is small and it's not collapsing even if you go down to a nanometer. So these are these are um, interesting um, details 
that very often come out later when you when you keep on progressing and implementing something yeah um so we're gonna get close to the conclusion here but so do you see the end of uh, this drive technology anywhere soon yeah i saw it 30 years ago as you know <laughs> everyone said it comes to an end <laughs> <laughs> because we have optical and 3D and uh, every, now we have probably DNA, I don't know, something will kill the disk drive. No, there is no, there is no quick end. What we, I mean, I, I can say this from, from WD, there was a time where the people thought, again, a rotating storage is coming to an end when the solid state, the non-volatile um, storage uh, came up. And everyone thought, oh, the, non, the solid state uh, memory will come down in cost and, and then the, the disk drive is here and then there's a crossover point. And it didn't happen the way it was predicted. It's still today roughly, depending on the application, five to eight times more, we, we, we just there was a, uh, from from Facebook, who obviously is a huge uh, consumer of storage, yeah. This is this is numbers from their side, yeah. The rotating storage is here to stay. There is nothing that replaces it in the uh, in the in the near future. So we need to, we and and we need to make it less expensive because yeah, everyone shows these exponential growth of data generation. We need to make the aerial density higher so we can have affordable storage. And said all this, even with the hammer taking a long time, maybe, maybe memor is uh, another branch of energy assist storage. Um, it will, the, the rotating disk drive is just, I think it's just hard to beat in the in the simplicity in the way. Once you have your recording technology all set up, the, um, and we still can improve what we do today, the mechanics, you know, the, yeah, now we're back at the mechanics where I said at the beginning, I love mechanics. It's still, it, I mean, we always thought a watch is a fantastic mechanical device, but our disk drive beats the watch <laughs> in many areas. <laughs> yeah. So, my belief is um, that this drive will be around for a long time, and if young people want to join this drive industry and, and have this, this um, eagerness to work in this field, it, it's a horrendously interesting area to work in. That's what I would say, yeah. And my last, last question, Ehard, is uh, so reflecting back again on your career and the success you had, uh, is there something that uh, you could have done differently that, you know, if you were to do it again, you would do differently? Um, given the situation today, I should have bought more houses, but... <laughs> Talking about your career. I failed completely in that <laughs> career path. <laughs> no, um, I... I, okay, I'm I'm 30 plus years in in this field, and at very early on, when when I was still the postdoc and I went back home um, to visit, I always shouldn't say always, maybe two three times, I gave presentation at my university about the disk drive technology, and even. Even there, people don't know what's in this disk drive, how it really works, you know, as an outsider. And I, I saw even there how people were fascinated, even from my simple presentation, when I showed them just the basics, yeah. And, and um, when, you, when you tell <coughs> a physicist, oh, here's a device, and we fly with 30 meter per second at sub one nanometer, they, they, they just get glary eyes because this is a fantastic accomplishment. And for me, and this is where I, again, came back to the overall disk drive. Doesn't matter if it's a servo or if there's a channel or if there's the chemistry on the interface. It's, it's such a large variety of um, problems that look at you and some you can solve, some, some are tougher, but there is no 
there is no time where you say, oh, it's all done. So for me, getting in touch with the disk drive technology was an, a, a real enhancement, I think. And it suited me well for my variety of interests. Yeah, I, I don't think, I don't know if I could have found a different field. Um, I sometimes uh, I thought about medical devices where, where I feel there is more um, immediate um, sense in helping other people. We, we, we often in the disk drive industry, or I ask myself, what, what good does it do? Yeah. And today with social media, you ask yourself twice. Social media wouldn't be existing without a disk drive. That is very clear. And, and with the things, the way social media is, has developed, you sometimes ask yourself, can I say now I'm not responsible for this? You know, this is a this is an um, ethical or moral question that comes up. I, today, I would clearly say the disk drive technology, I cannot set myself apart and say I have no responsibility in society because the disk drive um, has a big impact on society, the storage capability. So from, from that, and it also has obviously a lot of positive effects. So you always need to balance the negative and the positive. Luckily, I think the disk drive has more positive benefits than negative benefits. And that again fits my personality where I feel, yeah, it's, it's doing something great. It's giving me still the excitement and in uh, discovering new things and um, sometimes solving the problems and helping, helping the products to move forward. So I'm, I th don't know if I, I, I think I cannot say immediately what uh, should I have changed to, to feel better. I'm happy with it. <laughs> <laughs> with these words, uh, this concludes the interview. So I'd like to congratulate you again for your great career. You're actually still working. It's so still working, uh, yeah. I wish yeah. you the best for the years to come. And I'd like to thank you very much for being a good sport and uh, agreeing yeah. to spend two uh, grilling hours uh, answering our questions. So thank you very much, Ehart, and this concludes uh, the interview. Yeah, I just want to say one last, I also want to thank you for, I mean, you, you were part of my career, you know, you offered me opportunities, and um, I think we both agree we have um, great colleagues actually in the, in the community. So overall, it's, it's, a, it's a very nice, um, it's kind of a small community, but, but in a way, it works very well. That's how I look at it, yeah. Thank you also for your help me in my career. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Yard. <Art. laughs>